Uh, today we're going to talk about Firebase Crisis Mobile Teams. And uh, what I'd like to tell everybody is while this says Firebase Crisis Mobile Teams, this is about mobile teams, embedded teams, co-responder teams, either police or fire. Um, it is just about for everybody. And today we're going to talk about what I like to call the Responder 1.5. People are like, well, what the heck is that? And I'm like, well, you know, I'm a responder 1.5. So I am an individual who works within a fire department, but I'm not really considered a first responder. Uh, I happen to be the program manager for the Chandler, Arizona Fire Department's crisis team. We're going to talk a little bit about that, but mainly about this type of work that we do. Uh, I'm grateful to be a part of the National Association of Social Workers. I am a social worker. Uh, I've been involved in our crisis intervention team training for police officers for several years. Uh, I am a member and a coordinator through CIT International, a member of our seat of the state representation, as well as uh, a new member of our International Co-Responder Alliance. Um, over on the, on the screen, you're going to see a picture of me sitting in a recliner. This is what a lot of folks think that happens at the fire station a lot of times, especially our, our cohorts over on blue. They definitely like to give us a tease about sitting in recliners and watching movies all day, but that's typically not what happens when we are on shift. Uh, as far as this week goes, I'm happy to be doing this presentation this week specifically because it is National Co-Responder and Crisis Responder Week. So uh, for those who don't know, this is the first year that that week exists. I'm happy to talk about what our job actually entails. Hey, Jess, could you turn yeah. on your camera? Would you mind? Can I what? Turn on your camera. Oh, you know what? I, I think Kevin actually turned it off for me, so I wasn't able to turn it back on. You, you can uh, let, me, let me take a look and see if we can. I'm sorry, what, what recording do we need? There we go. Can you see me? Yes, ma'am. You're good. Thank All right. you. I am there. You got it. Let's start back where we were. Okay. So for all of my friends who are in fire service, this picture typically invokes some emotion. If this call kicks out and it's in your first due, the adrenaline is pumping. You are ready to go to this fire. You are very excited to get there and to show off the skills that you have and to get to work putting this fire out for folks. Um, this is what you signed up for as a first responder, right? To get there, to save lives and property and to keep the neighborhood safe the best you can. Unfortunately, there's a downside to this work. And really it's the traumatic stress. So while it's exciting for first responders to respond to calls like this and for firefighters to put that fire out, the folks that are involved in incidents like this are watching their lives disappear right in front of them. It's absolutely overwhelming for those folks. They have lost everything in their lives typically. And it's without control. They're leaving everything to the firefighters to save every last thing they possibly can. And they're holding on to hope that they're going to get something back from that house. And it's frustrating because folks who are involved in these type of incidents often have long lasting stressors. And that's the past, you know, when firefighters would go, they would take care of that fire and then they would start to try and mend for the folks who are involved in that incident. Uh, there was nobody like a responder 1.5. The firefighters were left to try and handle not only the call itself, but the people who are hurting. And that wasn't something that all of them initially signed up for. I wanna share with you guys a call. This is a behavioral health call. And honestly, when I talk to most first responders, whether they're fire, police, or otherwise, they say, well, I didn't know that so many of my calls were going to have a behavioral health nexus. 
I didn't realize the depth of behavioral health that I would have to see in my career. So this is a real call. She is a little difficult to hear, but I want you to hear it because I think it's important to talk about the resolution that comes from this type of a call. Uh, Probably dying here before we get out. That's why my husband tried to find some job right now. Okay, and we're getting down for me before we kill me because I tried not to kill me. Well, where are you right me. now? All the, uh, they threatened me so badly. All they did is bad things they have done to me. I've been doing you know, some kind of loving, caring with them, you know, they use, using me as a bonus and abuse me and hurting me. So why are you right now? I stop thinking them, both of them. call is not one that firefighters have clear resolution to. So they get that call two o'clock in the morning. It's not like the fire call where they're excited to get to that call. If they get this call, they're thinking, what the heck am I going to do with this individual? Or how can I help support this person? This isn't what I trained for. And that is the beginning of the Responder 1.5 because we needed to have a response that was trauma-informed. Understanding that first responders bring their own trauma to the scenes, they also have to be mindful that there are things that are said and done when they're on scene that are remembered. So as Timothy Dietz says, during the first three phases of this crisis, everything that's said, heard, felt and seen is permanently imprinted for the rest of the survivor's life. That's a lot of pressure. So first responders are often life savers, but how are they supporting individuals who don't need their life saved, but they need somebody to listen and to hear and to be compassionate? So how do we get there? Well, the present, currently, I am a part of a fire embedded crisis response team. It's a great team. I wanna share just a, a couple of very short videos with you about the team and some of the things that we've been through. Hi, Hearing the call come over, wondering, you know what, What's it gonna be? Is it, you know, traffic fatality or suicide? Wondering, am I gonna be enough? Am I gonna be able to hold it together? Am I, you know, maybe gonna break down? Or am I going to be able to keep it together and be strong enough for that? All right. So I'm a part of a fire-based crisis team, but there are 
crisis teams that are embedded in police as co-responders. There are teams that are housed in the county system that are responding to calls with us sometimes. And sometimes we get forgotten about. We may be within the fire service, but we often do not have some of the same resources that our first responders have. Our team is a 24 hour, seven day a week response, just like first responders. We are housed in a fire station and dispatched through a 911 system. We're not a new team, even though embedded crisis teams tend to be more popular now than they've ever been. Our team has been around for 20 years. And so in that 20 years, we've seen a lot of growth and we've definitely seen a lot of progress in this workforce. However, we haven't really caught up to how do we support these workers for the trauma that they're seeing. Uh, and that's the goal is to help support our community embedded responders in the future. Our role on scene looks like supporting fire and police with problem solving, uh, definitely acting as a liaison between the clients and all of the groups that are trying to serve them. Um, we are providing supportive short-term crisis intervention counseling uh, and assisting with all of the emotional, physical, and psychological needs. Um, we are the social service hub for our city. So not only for our fire department, for other departments within our city, we are able to connect them with valuable resources. So the knowledge base is thousands of different needs and several hundred different resources that we can provide at any given time. Here's the types of calls that a unit like mine would go on. Um, they're not the easy things. These are the things that all of the firefighters and police officers get that lump in their throat when these calls come over and the patient information comes across the screen. It is the drownings and the deaths and the very difficult homicides and suicides. Um, it's performing the death notifications for folks that are absolutely unexpected in the community uh, and are going along with life until something hits that they completely rocks their world at that point in time. Um, we definitely try very, very hard to support our vulnerable populations, our elderly and our children. And we work specifically with those that are struggling with mental illness in our communities. It is everywhere. There is nobody who is immune from the stress that currently exists right now in, in this year, 2023. What are the benefits of embedded co-responder teams? It brings a different lens to the table because we didn't get into this work as social workers and counselors to fight fire or to arrest individuals who have broken the law. We got into this work to be good advocates, to be great listeners, to work with individuals who don't feel seen and heard in our communities. So we can help ease the stress of some of these very difficult situations. We're not gonna resolve any of these issues. Uh, some of these things are permanent scarring issues and we will be there through them, but we won't be able to fix them or make them better. All we can do is walk alongside someone. Um, we try and stabilize to the best of our ability, and we always try to connect individuals with either their natural support system or somebody in the community who can follow through further along. Having a unit like this does come with some challenges. Um, it does require you to have a department and even a city that fully buys in to having multiple disciplines working together. You have to have funding for a unit like this. It is imperative to be able to support the employees and the work that's being done effectively with adequate funding. You need to be able to know roles and responsibilities. Where does my line stop? And where does the line of potentially a peer support begin? Uh, sometimes they're blurry, right? Sometimes we're helping those within our own departments with things that are happening. Uh, 
Um, and really the crux of all of this is you have to be able to find and hire and maintain clinicians with necessary skill sets, the right people to work in public safety. When I say that, what I mean is you can't have a social worker who is used to working in a school system or in potentially a locked jail or even a social worker who works in hospice jump right into a police car and be an embedded co-responder or jump right in with a fire station and think that they are going to be welcomed because it's a different environment. It's a different skill set when you have to respond immediately when that tone goes off. Um, as we all know, there's a clinician shortage in the country, so turnover is tough. It takes a long time to train and feel comfortable being a first responder, social worker, or an embedded clinician. Um, in this type of work, if you are embedded, you typically have a pretty limited response area. It's dictated by your funding, your city, and so you end up remaining in very close quarters in your own city or jurisdiction. This is our unit. Um, I'm pretty proud of it. I think the folks that work here are amazingly skilled. It is a complete crisis care model. And what that means is that there is three prongs. We are trying very hard to prevent ever having to go on calls. And that's through a lot of training. We're out in the community training about resources and about what we can do to help support folks. Um, we also do a lot of outreach and fun events. Those are the things we really, really enjoy. There's definitely the intervention side. Um, our unit's pretty busy. We're almost at capacity for what we're able to respond to. We respond to be between 1,700 and 1,900 calls a year. Those are just our dispatches. Beyond that, there's anywhere between three and 500 follow-up calls for calls that we didn't even make it to that crews have identified an ongoing need for our assistance. Um, we belong to something called a treat and refer protocol that it is through our department and supported by our medical direction, which says that we can be a part of diversion techniques. We can divert individuals from emergency departments and jail by transporting them to effective facilities like behavioral health, advocacy centers, shelter, schools, anywhere else other than an emergency room that they might need to go. And when those calls are over, we don't just forget about these folks, we actually follow up with them quite a bit. And so we may have a fire that we have an, indip an individual who's been displaced and supported by the American Red Cross. And we may call them back, ask them if they need additional resources or support um, for some of our folks that are high utilizers or tend to um, have multiple needs. We will provide short-term case management. Um, this year in our city, um, we've had the unfortunate um, privilege of assisting our city with debriefings and defusings following deaths of employees. So our unit not only responds out in the community, we take care of our own here in our city if they're struggling with something very hard. The positive outcomes of having a unit like this are, it really enables our first responder units to return to service faster. It gets them back to doing what they wanted to do when they began their career so many years ago, fighting fire and arresting or providing service and keeping people safe in the community. Um, it definitely puts the correct response in place and it allows for collaboration amongst multiple disciplines. How do we learn? We work together. And I think it's important that all folks have the ability to have not only a firefighter on scene, but somebody with the type of skill set that our clinicians have. It decreases the impacts of stress and trauma. And actually, this is multifaceted. So yes, it does decrease the harmful psychological effects on those that we serve in the community. But having a unit like this actually decreases the harmful psychological effects of stress and trauma on our firefighters. And how? 
Well, when they respond to these calls, if we are dispatched, we are able to relieve them from that call as fast as possible. So maybe they only need to remain on that scene with that individual potentially who has had a death in their family for 15 or 20 minutes. Our units may be on that same call for three to five hours waiting for the medical examiner or for a mortuary to respond. And so by taking that pressure and that burden off from our first responders to remain in these homes with folks during this crisis for extended period of time, we're sharing that physical load, but we're also sharing the psychological load. So what's the future look like? Well, the future is really bright. I'm gonna share a little bit more of our unit and we're gonna talk about that too. One of the difficulties is walking in and knowing that you're walking into something you're probably not totally prepared for. We can get somebody who is very calm and collected. They know exactly what they're doing. They don't need us to drive them down to the hospital. They'll be just fine. Other people, they're in basic meltdown mode. I've seen the whole gamut. I've seen the shock, uh, disbelief, anger, rage, happiness, extreme sadness, a lack of control. Uh, uh, somebody has uh, had a complete loss. Just when you think you've seen it all, something else will come up that will surprise you. Blood, guts, um, dead bodies. You're going to see all of it. You're going to see things that are upsetting. And these things that could trigger, you know, upsetting events that have happened in your own life. It doesn't matter your background, where you've been, uh, what you've gone through. It, it will break you down at one point or another. You will have feelings. You will go through emotions. Something will remind you of a time or an event that took place that will make you feel like, wow, I would never thought that could happen to me or happen to someone, but it does. And I was wondering, how am I going to let this impact my life? And what am I going to do about it? I mean, some people love to exercise, some people love to eat, some people love to sleep, some people love to talk. So this is what our responder perspective looks like. We carry the pain of others. As the folks in the video from around our community have shared, it is going to touch you. When you do this work, there are going to be calls that are extremely emotionally devastating to you. And it does bring up the triggers of things that have occurred in the past. And as Kimberly said in the presentation before, it takes a lot of work active work every day to keep doing this work, knowing that you are carrying the pain of others. And it can carry over if you're not careful. There are a lot of things that we wish. I don't know how to do this by myself. There is absolutely so many things that you need that person for. Your partner is like your battle buddy. And it helps a lot when that person is positive. After a sort of call or, or every call, uh, self-reflection, uh, talking about it with my partner. What I would like to talk about now are the things that firefighters and police officers see every day. We see two. And so as a responder 1.5, the high stress incidents begin to stack up. In our unit, and I can only speak to our unit alone, we do look at our high stress incidents for our embedded clinicians, for our non-sworn folks. And on average, every individual who works in this unit has at least 45 incidents per year that meet the criteria of a high stress incident. So I've given you a few of the examples over on the side of the types of calls that meet criteria for high stress. Um, those are things we're very familiar with, you know, things we've talked about before, drownings, gunshot wounds, hangings, stabbings, fires, any injury to a police officer or a firefighter that we may be a part of, um, difficult car accidents. Those are the things that our responder 1.5s are staying on scene and assisting with. And we begin to take that stress and hold on to it ourselves. 
And as we hold on to those things, we start to have barriers that are built. We may lash out at patients or clients or coworkers inadvertently. Nobody's doing it on purpose. We have unhealthy boundaries or we start to have coping skills that aren't the best for us. Um, the cynicism just starts to creep in over the years. Um, it becomes not my problem or their problem or everybody gets labeled as wanting attention or wasting resources. It tends to start showing up as issues between you and your coworkers or your bosses. Um, sometimes it ends up with attendance issues. You know, it's good to take a mental health day, but when attendance starts to slip and people are calling in sick or calling in, um, you know, more routinely than they typically would, look for the variance. You know, when people are doing things that they haven't done in the years, um, often it is because of stress and because of that cost of caring, that compassion fatigue that's starting to plague our workforce. I'm really excited that Kimberly was in front of us because, you know, as I listened to her presentation, um, I'm happy to report here in Arizona, our 911 dispatchers, uh, the first of the first responders, as we like to say, are now able to get free trauma therapy. So this has been in the works for a while and follows behind our first responders in getting trauma therapy. That is amazing. That's progress in the field. And I'm, I'm happy for all of our dispatchers. What I'd like to say is how do we support our embedded co-responders who are actually going out on these scenes and who are witnessing this firsthand and who are staying there for hours sometimes with these folks. Uh, unfortunately for us right now, uh, we don't have that representation and we are not able to get some of those same trauma services. Um, and how do we support it if that's not the case? Well, some things that your department may be able to do is include civilians, non-sworn co-responders in your member services teams on your peer support team. Let them have a voice. Let them see folks that are like them so that it isn't a sworn individual who is forced to call and talk to a civilian after a very difficult call. It's nice to see somebody who does your work, who gets it, who's gonna be there for you. Um, does your department co-train? And I'm not saying does your first responder get training on mental health from your crisis team. I'm saying are your first responders and your responder 1.5s training together about how to respond effectively? And what that does is build connection between the units. Um, like we talked about, is your, your department tracking the high stress incidents of, of non-sworn members and their responses. Um, if you have an embedded team or a co-responding team, I highly encourage you to track the number of calls that may meet that criteria, whatever the criteria is for you and your department. Um, whatever state you're in, do your state laws afford additional counseling services out of an e outside of an EAP for your responders? Um, and Really, where does a responder 1.5 go for help when things get dark? Who understands the type of work that we're doing? We need to develop a workforce of clinicians who can provide therapy for the folks who are out working in the field doing this type of work. Um, what can you do within your own control? Uh, for me specifically, I make a commitment to let go of work when I'm off hours to the best of my ability. Sometimes things come up and you've got to take care of it. I get that. But when you're off, try and do what you can do, get to bed at a good time, you know, and do things that you enjoy doing. For me, it's music and watching sports, being with family. Those are things that can help balance me out after a really rough shift or a rough week. Um, give yourself permission to eat properly, which is tough because if you're in this type of role, you know that you're on the go. It's not like in a fire station, 
where we can all sit together and eat dinner every night. Oftentimes our first responders are doing that, but we're still on those scenes. So even if we try to eat with them and they're very kind about allowing that, it's usually a plate with some tin foil pushed over on the counter that we get when we get back several hours later. Um, try and debrief the calls with somebody who understands it, a good listener. Um, most family members do not understand the work we do to the same degree, and it is very unhelpful to talk about those experiences with folks who are not doing this work. Um, they get the blank stare and you realize pretty quickly that it's not a conversation for the dinner table. i uh, like to remind everybody that it isn't selfish to focus on your own self-care. It really is the self-preservation that will keep our workforce going for the next 20 years. And it's making sure that we're good mo role models and practicing what we preach. Building a system of caring for our embedded clinicians is gonna take some time. We know that this is a new workforce that we are trying to put forth and it's for good reason. We wanna ensure that police and fire are doing the jobs that they were trained for, um, but we need to have some current national standards for embedded co-responders. At this time, we don't. Uh, we also don't have labor or union representation. Who are our advocates as Responder 1.5s? And what is the message that is being brought forward about the work that we are doing? Currently, there are not a lot of state or local governing laws about our work. When what that means is um, if I'm involved in an incident, I potentially do not have confidentiality. And as a non-sworn responder, I would not receive qualified immunity if something were not to go well on that call. Here in Arizona, we have something we're very proud of called the Craig Tiger Act. Um, unfortunate circumstances that led to the death of a police officer after a mental health that was absolutely tragically not addressed timely. Um, but now individuals are able to receive additional counseling and therapy services as first responders when they have been on a certain type of call, such as those high stress incidents. Our first responders receive that now. Our dispatchers are receiving that now. Our responder 1.5s our folks who are co-responding or embedded do not have that in enhancement for healthcare. And we'd like to see that in the future. So we wanna start having those conversations to preserve these careers. Some of the real positive is this is the first year, at the beginning of the presentation, I talked about the fact that this is the first year for our International Co-Responder Alliance National Co-Responder Week. So the fact that we have a week that is dedicated to recognizing that this is a workforce, that this is a workforce that is working alongside our first responders every day and that they are deserving of recognition is an amazing first start. But what I encourage, whether you have a co-responder in your agency, whether you're thinking about starting a co-responder program in your jurisdiction, is to look at all of it. Make sure that you're looking at the benefits to not only the community, but to the department, and make sure that you're also examining how you're going to support that workforce moving forward. Because it is a new -er workforce, um, we definitely have some growing pains, but I'm really proud that in the past 20 years in our department, our city has taken the stance that it's important, that it is valuable, that the folks out in the community deserve to have the level of care and customer service that a first responder may not have the time to do given the restraints and the job duties that they have. I definitely would like to say thank you to all of you, and I'm gonna get back on track time-wise for the conference, um, for hearing more about embedded crisis work, putting some thought into how you can support those that do this job in your areas around the country. And if you don't have a program, how you would begin a program. 
Um, it just takes one person to have the idea to begin to advocate on the benefits and to get this program and this movement started. We really do appreciate having the opportunity to serve our communities and do this work. Uh, it's a privilege. It's not for everybody. And we humbly think that we do pretty good, that we are really supporting folks and that we are making a difference in their ability to process these very difficult calls and move forward with hope and that their lives will get better. So I'd like to say thank you to all of you guys. Um, I will stick around for a little bit if there's any questions in the chat. Um, have a good afternoon. Jess, thanks so much. That's really, really great. Um, it's the first time that we've ever had a chance to hear from, as you know, from a perspective of a crisis response worker who's embedded in a fire department or even embedded in a police department. I could even have that, you know? And so I know, you know, for years you've been supervising these teams and really trying to take care of them. So, you know, you always hear the saying is lonely at the top, you know? And, and so from a supervisor, like a head person's perspective, taking care of teams like this, how, how do you manage all of that stuff? You know what? You don't do it alone. I will say that um, our geographical area is lucky. You saw in the videos that it's not just our Chandler specific unit. There are units in fire departments and police departments all over our valley. Um, so you find your allies, right? You find the folks who work in this niche. And for me personally, I really enjoy hearing the successes that they've had. So some of our departments around here have amazing growth recently, and that motivates me to keep trying and to find support for programs that we want to have in our own department. You know, um, I look for the small success, I think, you know, and I also know a lot of the work that we're doing is not going to benefit us in our current roles right now it is going to help the generations of co-responders and embedded clinicians that are going to exist in the future. Um, outside of that, you just have to have a, a pretty thick skin. Uh, you know, we're working in first responder land. It is not always easy. And some of the things that we see, um, you know, nobody's going to understand except for the other first responders that are out there with us. Um, but yeah. you don't do it by yourself. No, that's, that's really a solid statement. Teamwork makes the dream work, right? Mm -hmm. Amanda said, Jessica is humble. She helps everyone all of the time. And I absolutely second that. And I think that you're one of the sweetest people that I've ever met in my entire life. You know, like you're just so nice, you know, and so gracious and great. Like, I just can't say enough nice things about you as a person. Um, and I know that, and I'm certain that your staff appreciates that too, as a quality of a supervisor, someone that leads a team with a level head, someone who's level emotioned and takes the time to, I would guess that you, I mean, you have a lot of experience being a mom, so I would guess that you also have to mother these people as well, right? At times. No, you know what? Sometimes I learn more from them than, I always say I'm the dumbest person in the room and I really do mean it, you know? I mean, I am grateful to work with folks who have been in this field for a really long time and you know I take something from them on every single shift and, and try and improve myself because I think we're only responsible for ourselves what happens outside of us is outside of our control um, how we respond to what happens to us it really makes the difference so I, I don't need to mother anybody I, I think sometimes they have to put me to bed when I get mm -hmm. tired <laughs> how so where does someone start so we have people from all over the world here in this you know trying to figure out okay where how do i start doing something like this because we have had conversations about some of the barriers that you had to break through uh, initially and then all of a sudden the firefighters were like hey don't you ever get rid of those people we want them around forever right so if yeah. you don't want to turn that, that a little bit that'll be helpful sure yeah so we're a 24 hour unit and we are staffed so we have paid responders um, oftentimes what i'll see as newer departments or departments that are trying to start a program like ours they start with volunteers 
and they start with a smaller scope. So our unit began as a grief support unit. So it was a lot of compassionate care, right? It was water bottles and teddy bears and hugs. You know, they, they think, of, think of that when you think of crisis initially. Um, as we've grown and as we've proven our worth and as we've built trust within our first responder agencies and, and with our partnerships, uh, our practice scope also grew. Right. So folks said, well, I think that they can handle this. And then here, let's add this type of call. And so we started to grow. And then it was, well, they're not available at night. I think they need to be available 24 hours a day. And it wasn't us saying, hi, we'd like to work 24 hours a day. It was our department saying, this is a need we see. We would like them to be available. And so I think it grows organically. It's taken 20 years for us to have 15 paid responders uh, and we're also a training unit so we bring in social workers from universities to learn from us and be out in the field so that they know how to work with first responders because it is a niche that um, I didn't learn in college. If somebody would have said to me 30 years ago you're going to be working in public safety I would have laughed. That was never in in the dream for me right but you fall into what is supposed to be I firmly believe that this is the right place for me, and um, and I hope that we can help other programs get started. Yeah, super helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. Um, I see a whole bunch of different comments in here. One of the comments that were made was, you know, how do you get past the sworn first responder, the you know, on either the fire or or PD side looking down at, at civilian first responders. Um, how do you overcome that stuff? And what, do you have any kind of advice for that? Well, I think your roles need to be clearly defined. So for us, I, I don't wanna be a firefighter. Mm -hmm. I am unbelievably grateful for the work that they're doing. That is wonderful, life-saving work, but it is not for me. So they also do not, very much want to work in mental health or to work in grief and bereavement. Uh, when people start to cry, sometimes it gets a little uncomfortable, right? So the emotions of these calls are not what a lot of first responders got into the work for. Um, and so I think if you know what your boundaries are, what your role is, and you guys are, you know, every department's going to be different, you know, what the role is, um, you're able to stay in your own lane and build credibility because they're going to see that the services you're providing are helpful. It's getting them back on the street, doing what they need to do. It's preventing folks from you know, becoming high utilizers or frequent callers or whatever folks would like to say of the service. Um, so when those successes are there, highlight them. We're not very good about talking about ourselves in this work, you know, humbly in all first responder work. We don't like to talk about the good that we're doing. And so I think part of keeping these programs going and having folks respect you is seeing the work you're doing as valuable, seeing the results of the positive outcomes, and um, enjoying the work. You know, if your team comes to work and is happy to be there and is willing to support folks um, and, and do this job, you'll build the rapport you need to. And pretty soon they're going to be saying, when are you going to get another unit? We can't do this work without additional units. Yeah, well said. Thank you. It's something that, that you didn't say and uh, Kimberly didn't say is the the rush that you get from this too, you know, like one of the reasons that folks like crisis work is, is because we like diversity, no two days are the same. We get to help people in really tough situations. You know, we feel a sense of reward from it. Uh, and, you know, for dispatchers, and I, I, I wish Kimberly did have more time, but for dispatchers is also, you know, if you talk to a lot of first responders, they'll tell you, I think I have ADD, you know, I think I have ADHD. And so having all of this stuff to focus on really helps me to be able to stay grounded, you know. And uh, and I think that that is something that's worthwhile saying, I suppose, for crisis people, too. There's a lot of similarities, you know, in the work that we're doing because we're working in the same environments, right? We're people doing this job. 